Hi everyone, Blake here, and in this series, we're gonna get into all of the concepts relating to research that you'll need to know in order to ace your exam. In this video, we'll begin with an overall introduction to study types, paired with examples that will serve as a good foundation for further discussion on statistical analysis and data interpretation as we move throughout the topics of this section. Now, before we immediately dive into a discussion about all of the different types of studies for which you're responsible for knowing, we need to start off by establishing the importance of evidence-based dentistry. But first, what is evidence-based dentistry? Well, when you integrate a dentist's expertise, the patient needs and preferences, and the latest scientific evidence, the product is evidence-based dentistry. Now, the reason that evidence-based dentistry is so important is because dentists have a responsibility to their patients and to themselves to use evidence to guide practice to ensure that patient treatment reflects the best available evidence, techniques, and technologies. With science being as rapidly evolving as it is, it is of utmost importance that new information is being obtained, evaluated, and integrated to deliver the best possible care to patients. While not every dentist may be directly involved in conducting research, it's important to be proficient in research terminology and concepts so that you as a dentist can serve as a strong advocate for well-substantiated research findings and be able to discriminate between what new studies might be positing. Now that we've established why it's important for a dentist to understand the research process, we can begin describing the basic components of each study. Let's start with the exposure. The exposure is what causes or predicts the outcome. We can think of the exposure as the independent variable in the study. However, keep in mind that exposures are not always risk factors like a bacteria or a virus. They can also be protective factors such as fluoride varnish for teeth. We also have an outcome which is caused by or predicted by the exposure. We can think of the outcome as the dependent variable in a study or the variable that is being measured. It's also important to discuss the difference between observational and experimental studies. As the name suggests, an observational study observes participants and tracks outcomes over time, but does not utilize an intervention within the study. In other words, observational studies do not involve the researchers influencing treatment or the outcome of the participants. This type of study might be favorable for understanding how a treatment might fare in a day-to-day -day setting. Because the participants enter the study as they are, these studies also take less time to conduct or participate in. For instance, participation in an observational study can be as simple as participating in a single blood draw or filling out a questionnaire from time to time. An example of an observational study you yourself may have participated in is filling out the CDC's health assessment survey following the COVID vaccination. An experimental study, on the other hand, is used to test an intervention which refers to an action or treatment that's administered to the study participants in order to assess the outcome. Examples of interventions include new drugs, medical devices, and medical procedures. This type of study may also be referred to as a clinical trial. We'll get more into interventional studies as we progress through this video, but in general, just know that many interventional studies are placebo-controlled, which allow researchers to adequately compare the two groups in order to best evaluate the treatment's effectiveness. Now let's go ahead and discuss the difference between prevalence and incidence. Prevalence tells us how much of a disease exists at a specific point in time or over a specified period for a given population. This can be helpful for deciding how to distribute resources in order to tackle diseases. On the other hand, incidence tells us how fast a disease is occurring within a population. This is a high yield topic, so make sure you remember that prevalence is how much and incidence is how fast. Okay, so with that foundational information out of the way, we can now get into our discussion on study types, of which there are six that you should be familiar with, and they are listed from lowest validity to highest validity as follows. So first, we have case studies. Next, we have cross-sectional studies, then case control studies. Following case control studies are cohort studies, then randomized control trials, and finally, we have systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Now, because systematic reviews and meta-analyses are susceptible to the least amount of study bias, they represent the types of studies that possess the greatest validity. Okay, now let's start going through each individual type of study, starting with case studies. Now, a case study is a study involving a small collection of individual cases. It's an observational study with a very small sample size and no control group. Essentially, the researcher is simply reviewing the medical records for a few people with a particular exposure or disease. A case study can often be helpful when studying very rare exposures or diseases, but the small sample size paired with the lack of a control group limits the validity of any conclusions that are made. But in certain situations, this is the best evidence that's available. Next, let's talk about cross-sectional studies. A cross-sectional study is a study that collects data by taking a snapshot of exposure and outcome at a certain point in time. It's like taking a cross-section. We can observe the relationship between exposure and outcome at one point in time. 
In fact, this is what makes them so useful in measuring the prevalence of a specific outcome or disease. Due to the nature of the cross-sectional study, they are always observational. This is also the major drawback of a cross-sectional study, as it's hard to establish temporality since we can't determine whether the exposure really came first to cause the outcome. Let's move on to case control studies. When conducting a case control study, we begin by identifying individuals with the outcome of interest. Then, we carefully select a group of similar individuals without this outcome of interest. The group that doesn't have the disease or outcome of interest is known as the control group. Then, we determine the exposure status of the participants from each group based on their past. This is why case control studies are retrospective and observational. Try to remember that in a case control study, you start off knowing whether a person is diseased in the case group or not diseased in the control group. Let's examine this graphic together. Remember that in order to conduct a case control study, the researcher must first identify a group of individuals who have a particular outcome of interest. This group will represent the case group. Then, the researcher must carefully select a group of individuals that are similar to the case group, except they don't have that particular outcome. This group will represent the control group. Then, through retrospective observation, determine whether or not the participants from each group had an exposure to a particular risk factor in the past. There isn't a huge difference between retrospective cohort studies and case control studies. You're basically doing the same steps, but in a slightly different order. However, the two study designs are used in different settings. The key advantage to case control studies is that they're more efficient for rare outcomes. However, this study design can only assess one outcome at once, and we cannot estimate incidence or prevalence because the amount of disease in the population is fixed by the number of participants in each group enrolled. Additionally, it can be tricky to find similar individuals to represent each group within the study. If you find it hard to remember what happens in a case control study, just remember, the word control is the second term in the phrase case control, because finding the control group of individuals is the second step in this study after selecting individuals with the outcome. Next, we'll be discussing cohort studies. A cohort is a group of people observed over a period of time to determine how a disease or treatment occurs or progresses. In this design, we begin with a cohort or population of interest without the outcome. Then we determine the exposure status. One group may be exposed to smoking cigarettes while the other group does not smoke. Then we observe the outcomes to see how the oral health of the two groups develops over time. Cohort studies can either be prospective or retrospective. In a prospective study, the survey outcome has not yet occurred when the survey starts, but the outcomes to be measured are defined. In a retrospective study, the outcome has already occurred, such as an illness, and the researchers look back at patient history to discover risk factors or predictors. One of the main drawbacks of a cohort study includes long waiting periods for prospective studies, especially of tracking onset of a disease and having to wait years for the illness to develop. This can be costly, both in terms of time and money in the long run, and may result in a loss of follow-up with study participants. The population chosen must also be at risk for the outcome of interest, meaning that some must develop the outcome in the future. However, the benefits of a cohort study are that we can measure more than one outcome at once. The fifth type of study that we'll be discussing is the randomized controlled trial. These are the gold standard of research for therapeutic and preventative interventions. For the exam, it's important to understand that randomized controlled trials are experimental. This is because investigators are experimenting with participants by manipulating exposure. Experimental studies are the same thing as interventional studies because the researchers are intervening and not just observing in these studies. In randomized controlled trials, the researchers have a high level of control over most factors, which allows for randomization and blinding, which aren't possible in many other study types. In clinical trials, participants are assigned by the researcher, while in observational studies, natural conditions, such as personal preference, genetics, social determinants, environment, and lifestyle, are what ultimately assign the groups. When conducting a randomized controlled trial, the researchers must ensure that the assignment to groups is completely random so that only the effects of the intervention are being compared and very few other external factors influence the results. Random allocation thus ensures that differences between the two groups are due to the treatment and not something else. This could also be an area of potential limitation if not done properly. For example, not double-blinding could result in a biased interpretation of the data. In addition, you can see that in this graphic, the intervention group received the colored intervention pills. Meanwhile, the control group received the gray pills, which indicate a placebo treatment. Placebo treatments are considered inert or sham treatments that allow for control group comparison, as well as helps maintain blinding so that participants, and sometimes researchers in the case of double-blinded studies, don't know who received which treatment. Finally, the highest level of validity comes from systematic reviews and meta-analyses. 
A meta-analysis is the process of taking multiple results from multiple different studies and combining them to reach a single conclusion. A meta-analysis is usually based on randomized controlled trials and is a quantitative, formal, epidemiological study design used to systematically assess the results of previous research to derive conclusions about that body of research. They are therefore a subset of systematic review, which attempts to collate empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria to answer a specific research question. Consider this example which poses the question, is fluoride varnish effective in reducing the incidence of dental caries in children and adolescents? In one study, the conclusion is yes, while in the other study, the conclusion is no. Regardless, conducting a meta-analysis allows for the compilation of data between the studies, ultimately increasing the sample size while simultaneously allowing for a comparison of certain factors like the level of oral hygiene, a history of cavities, and socioeconomic challenges between the two studies. Doing this is sort of like creating one huge study with a very large sample size, leading to a greater impact when compared to each individual study alone. The main limitation to meta-analyses lies in execution. Poor execution can result in carelessness when abstracting and summarizing appropriate studies, and failure to consider different biases or overstatements can lead to invalid meta-analyses. Now that we've gone through each individual type of study, we can now move on to an extremely high-yield topic on your exam, which is the hierarchy of studies pyramid. At the very top of the pyramid, we have the cream of the crop, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. These types of studies represent the most rigorous studies with the highest validity, which is also the most generalizable to populations. Then going down the list, we have randomized control trials, cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, and finally case studies, which have the lowest validity. It's not enough that you know that systematic reviews and meta-analyses are at the top, the order in which all of the studies appear on the pyramid is high yield, so make sure that you review this for your exam. We can rationalize this pyramid by knowing that case control studies are more valid than cross-sectional studies and case studies because they contain control groups. Meanwhile, trials are better than observational studies because they offer more control to the investigators. And finally, reviews and meta-analyses are better than trials because they harmonize information from multiple studies, which is better than looking at one individual study alone. Now that we've established the different types of studies and how valid each are, let's finish up by discussing some study designs. The two key study designs are cross-sectional and longitudinal, and they differ in the timing of the study. Now recall that we've already discussed cross-sectional studies earlier. They collect data by taking a snapshot of exposure and outcome at the same time, which measures prevalence. On the other hand, longitudinal studies can help us establish temporality. There are two types of longitudinal studies. The first type of longitudinal study is known as a retrospective study. A retrospective study looks backwards in time and studies exposures to suspected risk or predictive factors that relate to an outcome established at the start of the study. While this may seem like a favorable study design, it can potentially become problematic if different confounding variables are not adequately accounted for. These confounding variables, or any variable that could potentially affect the outcome of the study, could be anything from different social determinants of health, age, weight, race, etc. An example of a retrospective study is examining patient head CTs to assess the patient's risk for developing a TMJ disorder. A prospective study, on the other hand, watches for outcomes such as the development of disease during the study period and relates this to other factors such as different risk or prediction factors. Different from retrospective studies, prospective studies usually have fewer potential sources of bias and confounding variables since the study has not already occurred, allowing us to introduce greater effort to ensure closer patient follow-up. An example of a prospective study includes tracking patients who use vape pens and assessing their caries risk. It's important to note that both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies are used to measure association between variables. All right, everyone, that's going to conclude the content that's covered in this video. So let's go ahead and test our understanding with some example questions. The first question asks us, a researcher was evaluating the durability between traditional and CAD CAM dental crowns. The overall durability of the crowns was evaluated by conducting fracture toughness tests and the Vickers hardness test. What is the dependent variable in this study? We have option A, dental crown production technique, B, Vickers hardness test, C, fracture toughness tests, and D, durability of dental crowns. Now the correct answer for this question is option D, durability of dental crowns. So remember that the dependent variable is the outcome of the study or the parameter being measured. In our case, it's the durability of dental crowns that's being evaluated. Although it may be tempting to choose Vickers hardness test or fracture toughness tests, these are simply tests that are used to evaluate the durability of the crown, which is the variable being compared. Now, what if the question asked us to identify the independent variable in this study? Well, in that case, because traditional and CAD-CAM crowns are produced in different ways, 
The answer would be option A, which is the dental crown production technique. The next question asks us, which of the following study designs provides the highest level of evidence when researching the impact of dental x-ray exposure on pregnant patients? We have option A, randomized clinical trial, B, case control studies, C, cohort studies, and D, expert opinions. And the correct answer for this question is option A, randomized clinical trial. So remember that systematic reviews and meta-analyses encompass many results to reach a single conclusion, giving systematic reviews and meta-analyses the highest level of evidence. However, as you can see, this option is not available. Therefore, we must select the next best option, which is randomized clinical trials. Remember that randomized clinical trials offer high levels of evidence because they're experimental and not just observational. This allows the researchers to have a high level of control over the study. Question number three asks us, a group of individuals who frequently engage in high-risk sports is monitored over 10 years to evaluate the occurrence of sports-related injuries. What type of study design would be utilized for this analysis? We have option A, cross-sectional, B, cohort, C, case control, and D, experimental. And the correct answer for this question is option B, cohort. So remember that a cohort is a group of people that are observed over a period of time to determine how a disease or treatment occurs or progresses. Now, in this case, the cohort is the group of individuals who frequently engage in high-risk sports. Therefore, option B, cohort study, is the correct answer for this question. Moving on to the next question, we have which of the following study types involves enrolling two sets of participants, one with the outcome and one without it, followed by conducting analyses. We have option A, cross-sectional, B, cohort, C, case control, and D, randomized clinical trial. And the correct answer for this question is option C, case control. So remember that in case control studies, we begin by identifying individuals with the outcome. Then we carefully select a group of similar individuals without the outcome. Then we can determine the exposure status of each participant from each group based on their past. Now in this question, we can see that there are two sets of participants, one group that has the outcome and one group that does not have the outcome. So the group with the outcome would be the case group and the group without the outcome would be the control group, indicating that this is a case control study. Therefore, option C is the correct answer. Next, we have question five, which asks, what term describes the number of cases of influenza in New York since the start of 2022? We have option A, confounding, B, incidence, C, prevalence, and D, cross-section. And the correct answer for this question is option C, prevalence. So we need to remember that prevalence tells us how much of a disease exists at a specific point in time or over a specified period for a given population. This is in contrast to incidence, which tells us how fast a disease is occurring within a population. Always remember that prevalence is how much and incidence is how fast. So to summarize, in this video, we talked about the importance of evidence-based dentistry. We got introduced to the different categories of studies and learned about the six main types of studies that may appear on your exam. We also ranked each study type on the hierarchy of studies pyramid based on the level of validity that each one offers. I really hope this video helps and I wish you luck on your study journey.